Good morning, everyone. In your Bibles this morning, if you brought a Bible, Mark chapter 3. If you hadn't, haven't brought a Bible, the words will be up here on the screen, so you'll get a chance to see those in, in just a second. I uh, want to say welcome back to Pastor John in the, in the words of Pride and Prejudice. We haven't heard two sensible words spoken together since you left, so <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back, yeah. Uh, those of you... Those of you that might not understand uh, the sabbatical, uh, Pastor John uh, was on a sabbatical for two months. Uh, the elders asked that uh, first Pastor John and then Pastor Tom take a sabbatical, not as a rescue type of mission, but just as a maintenance sort of thing. And so uh, Pastor John took two months off and uh, enjoyed just rest and relaxation and uh, be able to approach the Lord in a different setting. And so I'm sure that was great, as he said. And now Pastor Tom is on his sabbatical, so he'll be gone for two months. We really wanted to give Pastor Tom three months, but he wouldn't hear of it. So he's only gone two months like Pastor John. Now, Pastor Dave is also going on sabbatical. We're giving him a year, but uh, he might... <laughs> Not for the same reasons I just mentioned about Pastor John and Pastor Tom. You tell him I said that. <laughs> okay, in our Bibles this morning, this is uh, Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 13. We'll just read a few verses here, then we'll pray. I have a few short comments to make, and then we'll pray again, and then we'll go out and do the things that the Lord's asking us to do. It says here in verse 13 of chapter 3 of Mark, And he went up on the mountain, speaking of Jesus, and summoned those who he himself wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we're thanking you for the many, many things that you've given us, realizing that every good thing comes from above, Lord. We just say thank you for that. Lord, we say thank you for not overlooking your people, not forgetting your people, Lord, but pursuing us pursuing us more than we pursue you. Lord, that your desire for us is much greater than our desire for you, Lord. We just say thank you. Thank you for pursuing us, not letting us go. Thank you for standing in our path. Lord, when we get off the path, you'll stand in our way and direct us back to the path. We say thank you for that. We say thank you for encouraging us through your word and protecting it this, these thousands of years. We say thank you for that and thank you for the things that you have in store for us in the next few moments, Lord. We're praying our hearts open to the things that you'd say to us. Lord, we know that you wouldn't ask us to do things that you wouldn't enable us to do. And so, Lord, ask of us and enable us to do the things that you're asking us to do. So, Lord, we're just giving you thanks for this today. Encourage us, strengthen us, correct us, and let it be so all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you briefly this morning about God's call upon our lives. In that call, God has desired that we be fruitful. That we be fruitful in the things that he's called us to. He has given us authority. He has equipped us with his Holy Spirit. He has worked in us. But there are some basic things that I think from this passage today, there are some basic things that the Lord wants from us that enables us to be those who he wants us to be. Now it's true that God is shaping us into the image of Jesus Christ, that that is his goal. The Bible tells us that in the New Testament in three different places, that he is shaping us according to his foreknowledge, according to his predetermined plan into the image of Jesus Christ. He says in Ephesians 4 that we are growing into the measure of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will never be exactly like him, but we are growing into the measure of him in this life. And so that's the Lord's intention. It's also the Lord's intention, as I said just a moment ago, that we be fruitful in this life. That we be fruitful in the things that he's asked us to do, that we walk with authority, the authority that he's given us, and that we be that in the world which he has intended us to be, that we be those ambassadors in the world. So from Jesus' call this morning, there are just a few principles that I want to draw your attention to. First of all, that God has given us authority. You read in the last verse that I read to you this morning. That God has given us authority. Now, this is authority. Uh, a couple of things are explicit, and then one is implicit, I believe. But 
actually three things that he, that he says here or implies is this. Is that first of all, he gives us authority over all the works of the enemy. That there's no hold that the enemy can have upon us. It doesn't mean that we have to shake and shout and bawl and squall and, and all those things. Jesus cast out demons along with some of his disciples, cast out demons with a single word. That the enemy has to obey those that walk in authority. He has to obey. And so the enemy can be put to flight with simply a single word. Secondly, he gives us authority in this way to preach his word. Or better for us, proclaim his word. Oftentimes when we use that word preach, we automatically think of the preacher or the person up front. But God is really desired for each of us to proclaim his word. We are his ambassadors in this world. You know, it makes me think this morning of Paul when he wrote the Thessalonians. He says, you know, you guys have become an example to all of Macedonia and Achaia. And so we have need of saying nothing. Because of your testimony, because of what you've done, Thessalonians, we have no need to do anything in all of Macedonia and all of, all of Achaia because of what you've done. You see, this is the purpose of the Lord that we as his children be his ambassadors in the earth. That is his desire. Not just the preachers and not just the elders and not just the deacons and evangelists and prophets and those, but each of us be ambassadors for him here in the world. And so in these verses, Jesus is calling those he will eventually send out, but he's also giving them authority to preach the word. As you look in the New Testament, you see such authority that God gives. You see 3,000 coming to the Lord in one day and 5,000 another day. Peter is baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and taking his stand with the other 11, it says that he stood there and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just a while later, he's preaching again and soon after that, 3,000 come to the Lord, then 5,000 come to the Lord. It's said of the disciples of those days, that they had filled Jerusalem with their teaching. In another place, it says, those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. In another place, it says that all of Asia has heard the word. In another place, you have filled Macedonia and Achaia with your teaching. So this is just the indication of the, of the spread of the gospel in these days because God had given them authority and given them anointing to proclaim the gospel as his ambassadors. And then one last thing, to heal the sick. So these three things, to preach the word, uh, to cast out demons, and to heal the sick. We believe in our church that God has given authority to believers to heal the sick. I mean, he heals them through us, but we lay hands upon people and believe that God will heal them. Now, why God heals some and doesn't heal others, we don't know that. We don't know that, but that's God's call. The Bible says that God is in heaven. He does as he pleases, and that's our stance. But we know that God will heal, and we know that God has healed, and that God will show himself and glorify himself in healing. Healings aren't always spectacular or extraordinary. Many were in the Bible, but even Luke writing in the book of Acts, he says that Paul was was exhibiting or working many extraordinary miracles. And in that passage that he says that, he says that even a handkerchief taken from Paul would be taken to sick people, and when it came from Paul's body and touched the other body, they would be healed. Extraordinary miracles or extraordinary miracles. God doesn't always do the spectacular, but God is always working. And God will work through our prayers, and God will bring healing. But there are a few things that we must realize to walk in this power, to walk in this authority, to walk in this fruitfulness. And I think they're found here in this passage, at least made reference to here in this passage. So look with me at verse 13. This is how Mark starts out this particular passage. He says, and he went up on the mountain again, speaking of Jesus, of course, and he went up on the mountain, he summoned those who he himself wanted, and they came to him. Notice, first of all, that God summoned those that would be his. This idea of summoning has a few parts to it that I want to I show you this morning. 
And first of all, the whole idea speaks of God looking for somebody to the use. Do you know that in the Old Testament and New Testament for that matter, God is often pictured as looking for someone to use. You might remember in the book of Ezekiel, where God is actually bringing judgment on Israel because they have been wayward, they've been away from him. And they have, they have uh, blasphemed him and actually turned away from him. And he's bringing judgment on Israel and he says this, he says, I have looked for a man. I have looked for a man who would stand in the gap and intercede for me between me and my people, but I could find nobody. You see, God is looking. God is looking for someone who he can use. He's looking at someone, just a vessel. It doesn't have to be anything special for God. He's just looking for a vessel to use, and that's the picture of God. God being proactive in the world, looking for someone to use. The same thing is true, we read in Chronicles of King Asa, king of, king of Israel. And at that particular time, uh, the, the king was reigning and he had had a glorious uh, victory over the Ethiopians and the Lubim. And he, what had happened was he had trusted in God instead of chariots and horses, he had put his trust in God and God had given him victory over the Ethiopians and Lubim. But later on in Asa's life, he trusted in the armies that were around him and in his, in his own army. And the prophet comes to Asa and he says, because you have not trusted in the Lord, because you do not have trusted in the Lord, I will bring judgment. He says in that particular place, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he might strongly support those that are completely his. This is his words to Asa. He said, don't you know that the eyes of the Lord are moving throughout the earth to support those that are wholly his? This is the picture of the Lord that we have, that the Lord is always looking. He's always looking. He's always pursuing for someone to pour out his authority and his anointing upon. So here's the first part. It's just simply that God is looking. The second part is this, that God is calling. First of all, looking, but secondly, calling. That he's calling to those around him to come. Like he called to these, he saw them. And it says here that he summoned them to where he was. In another passage in Mark chapter 8, it says he summoned the crowd crowd to him. And so there was this crowd about him and he just simply said, come this way. And he began to sit down and teach them. In another place, Luke chapter 13, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And while teaching there, he sees a woman bent over for 18 years. And I love how it simply says here that he called her to himself. You see, oftentimes we think that we need to be the ones that are pursuing God. But understand this, that God is calling to us. That God is calling us to himself, and that is God's posture. God isn't on vacation somewhere, or on sabbatical. But God is pursuing us. He is after us. Well, Greg, I just don't sense him, and I just don't. We're going to get to that in a second. God has a plan, but know this, that he is pursuing us. He is calling us. He is after us. You know, there is this passage in the Old Testament that I just love, and I've referred to it before, but this is the account of Mephibosheth. And you'll remember Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is is the grandson of Saul, King Saul, the son of Jonathan, and uh, David's, who was David's friend, And when David took over Jerusalem, when the armies conquered Jerusalem and Saul and Jonathan were were, um, killed in the the, uh, melee there, and Mephibosheth survived. He was the grandchild who survived. Now, oftentimes when conquering armies took over a place, they would kill everybody because they didn't want the family to be there because they would rise up within the new, within the new uh, administration and cause problems. So they just normally just wiped them all out. But David would not do it. In fact, in this passage here, he says this. 
in uh, this is second or second Samuel chapter nine verse one. He says, "Then David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake?" Notice this first of all, that David is wanting to show kindness to someone in Saul's house. Now this word kindness in the Old Testament is the Old Testament word hesed. And I only bring it up because it is a powerful word. It's the word that is often translated kindness or loving kindness used oftentimes in the Old Testament. David is looking for someone to show mercy. He's not looking for anyone in particular. As we read on, he simply says this. The king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness? You see, David isn't looking for anybody high in rank. He's not looking for anybody wealthy. He's not looking for anybody of a certain people group. He's not looking for anything like that. He's simply wanting to pour out blessing upon the house of Saul to show loving kindness. You know, in the same way, God's calling is like that in our lives. As I said earlier, God isn't looking for anything special. He's just looking for someone who will respond, I will. He's just looking for someone who will answer the call, yes, I'll follow you, Lord, where you are leading me. That's all he's looking for. If we could simply do that, that's the first step. If we could simply just, just follow him when he calls, says, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. If we could just simply come to that point, that would be a huge step. He goes on to say here in this particular section that when uh, Mephibosheth came before him, he says, he says, Mephibosheth, you are going to eat at my table all the days of your life. You're going to eat at the king's table all the days of your life. He brought him in and Mephibosheth thinks that he's going to chop off his head or, or execute him in some other way. And, and instead he says, Mephibosheth, I want to show you kindness. I want to show you tender mercy. I'm going to bless you. You're going to eat at the king's table. He does a bunch of other things for him in this passage to make sure that he's taken care of all the days of his life. Four times in this short paragraph or in this short section, he says that you are going to eat at the king's table that you're going to be blessed by the king's table. And three times in this short paragraph, he says that Mephibosheth was lame in both legs. Now, if you don't know this about Mephibosheth, when the invading armies came through, his nursemaid picked him up and was running away and fell down with Mephibosheth, and he became lame in both feet. And so even to this day, now Mephibosheth is grown and has, has children, but even to this day, still lame in both feet. In fact, the section ends by saying this. Now he was lame in both feet. I ask myself the question. Oftentimes when the Bible repeats things, it is for emphasis. That was the Jewish way. And, uh, that was the Mediterranean way, basically, in this culture. Is that to repeat, when you repeat something, it is for emphasis. And so why was this repeated three times in this section? Why did it keep saying, and Mephibosheth was lame in both feet? You know, guys, I just think it's a testimony of God's grace. Mephibosheth was nothing special, and yet God, God, through David, chose him to bless. That God, through David, picked him and called him and brought him to himself. And that he could eat at the king's table. That he wasn't going to have to eat somewhere else, or he wasn't going to not be taken care for, but he was going to be taken care for at the king's table. And then this final passage and Mephibosheth was lame in both feet. You know, I think it's just a reminder of grace in our lives. I think we all have those reminders, don't we? Just when we're sailing right up here, things are going really smooth, all of a sudden you blow the engine or something, and you know, they used to say crash and burn. Those things happen to remind us that we are lame in both feet, so to speak. That God has called us for a purpose, yes. That God wants to empower us, yes. That he wants to place his authority on us and make us fruitful, yes, yes, yes. But we have to realize that it's not in ourselves. It's not in what we can do, but it's only through what God, it's only in what God can do through us. That is where we want to be. We want to be in a place where God can use us. We just want to be a conduit of his strength and his power in the world because, frankly, 
we can't do it. We don't have the energy, we don't have the strength, we don't have the gifting, we don't have the ability. Anything we do in and of ourselves isn't going to be lasting anyway. The only things that are going to be lasting are the things that Christ does through us. So he calls Mephibosheth to himself to eat at the table. And I just have to think, whenever Mephibosheth came to the table, you could hear him some distance away. Whether it was the dragging of his feet or whether it was the cloppity-clop of some sort of crutch device or, or however he got to the table. And you just think that often the family's around the table and you can just hear, all of a sudden you hear the clippity-clop of, here comes Mephibosheth. And just a reminder of God's grace in our lives every day. Eating at the table every day, a reminder of God's grace in our lives. That we are lame and yet he has called us. He'd been, he's been looking for us and he's calling to us. Lastly, I think this idea of summoning has this with it. Not only God looking and not only God calling, but God choosing. That God chooses us to be with him. The apostle John, or John says in his, in his gospel, he says, he says this, he says, um, quoting Jesus, I, uh, you have not chosen me, in, in John chapter 15, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You know, it says in the book of Ephesians that he has chosen us from the foundations of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but that brings great encouragement to my life. Knowing that I've been chosen of the Lord. Now, now don't misunderstand like here in Mark chapter 3 where it says, uh, he summoned those whom he wanted and they came to him. Notice here that they had to come and we still have to come. Implicit in this idea of choosing is that we choose him as well. He chooses us, but we choose him as well. Both have to be at work. But I think to understand this correctly is to understand in this way that it's God that is pursuing us. It is God that is after us. It is God that wants to use us. It's God that's calling. It's God that's looking. It's God that's choosing, even from the foundations of the, of the earth. You know, I see it so much like this. I see it like adoption. You know, we had four kids who we loved dearly. I used to say this to them when they were young. I would say, I would say to others in their presence, uh, teasing them, I would, say, uh, I would say, you know what? I wouldn't sell any of my kids for a million bucks, but I wouldn't pay a dollar for another one. Because in some ways, I mean, I, I love my children. Where are they? love my children. And nowadays, I would pay a million bucks for more, but in those days, wouldn't give a buck for another one, but wouldn't sell one for a million bucks either. But you know, when you adopt a child, you choose. You choose. I mean, there are many adoption agencies where they'll show you, I mean, you go through the whole application process and all that, and they want to make sure you're safe, and then they'll show you pictures of children. And you choose the child. I can hardly imagine. I can hardly imagine. You know, oftentimes when, when people are adopted, and there's probably many people here that have been adopted, oftentimes we wonder about, why did my mom or my parents give me up? And some people that are adopted don't even know who their, who their parents are. But you know, there's another, play, there's another aspect to this, is that there is actually someone who has chosen me. There as someone who, who looked at my picture or, or looked at me or knew my situation and has actually chosen me. There is someone that have gone out of their way to pick me, pick me the way I am to choose me. Guys, I don't know what that does for you, but that just really warms my heart in so many different ways. That God has chosen me to be his vessel. That he has chosen me to work for him. That he has chosen me to be his. Yes, I had to choose him as well. But it was him who was pursuing me. It was him that was coming after me. He chose me. 
You know, it used to be years ago before my softball career was tragically, prematurely ended with a slide into second base and a broken arm, that uh, I would, you know how teams divide up and you got captains and then they choose people? I'd become quite used to being either the first one chosen or the second one chosen. Now, this is when I was about 20 years old. And I took a little bit of pride in that, that, hey, you know, I could just be expected first or second, I'd be chosen to be on the team. And uh, that was all right with me. But you know, the older I got, I started getting cho- chose farther down, the, farther down the thing. And, you know, pretty soon I was like second to last. So I thought I just better retire before, you know, the inevitable comes and you're standing there by yourself and, you know, both teams just walk away and nobody wants you, you know, sort of thing. And, It was something special to be chosen. To be chosen, not to be flung on somebody. And I think sometimes we think this of the Lord. Well, the Lord had to take me because I wanted him so bad. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the Lord had been after you the whole time. I think the Lord had been doing stuff in your life to bring you to the point where you're finally going to say, okay, Lord, I want you. That he had been after you the whole time, even from the foundations of the, the world, the Bible says. That he has chosen us according to his foreknowledge. He has chosen us in the world. You know, for me, that brings joy. Joy in my service. Because I know that I've been chosen. It also brings assurance of purpose. That I know God has called me to something. Now still, I have to pursue him and figure out what are the things that you're calling me to. But I know that he has called me for a purpose. He just hasn't called me to sit on the sideline. He has called me for a purpose. Like he's called you for a purpose. Each one of us. And then finally, there's a hope for the future. That no matter what's going on now, I know God has a better future for me. I know that that is God's plan. I mean, God brings us through hard things to be sure. But he brings us through hard things for a better future. That's the promise of the Lord. That he brings us through those things for a better future and that our latter days will be better than our former days. Now, if we were just pursuing him and he wasn't pursuing us, we would have none of these things. But because he's pursuing us, it brings that joy. It's like being chosen first on the team. Lord, Lord, just, I I mean, I've just, I just, uh, I am filled with purpose because because you have chosen me. So we see the Lord in this way. We see the Lord summoning his disciples, number one. In that summoning, we see this. We see the Lord looking. We see the Lord calling. And we see the Lord choosing us. That is a big deal. Now, I've used about a half hour of my time. In those backslidden churches, the pastor would be ending by now, but I still got quite a bit of time left. (laughs) Just kidding, just a few more minutes. Uh, So what's the big deal, Greg? You've set this up. I mean, you've taken a half hour to kind of set this up. I mean, what, what is God what does God have for us? I mean, what has he got for these here? This is what he says. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the big setup. Verse 13, and he went up to the mountain and he summoned those whom he himself wanted and they came to him. That's our part. God's pursuing us, but we must turn to him. Then 14, and he appointed 12. Here we go. This word appointed is translated in other translations, ordained. It means to set in place with a purpose. Okay? So he or ordained, or he appointed 12. Here it comes, here it comes. He appointed 12 so that they would be with him. Now that sounds a little anticlimactic, doesn't it? I mean, I was expecting something like, you know, and you'll go out and save the world, or, or you know, you'll go out and you'll do this, and, and uh, I got this for you ahead, you can do this, and, and my power's on you, and my anointing, and Holy Spirit, and, and authority's on you. Here's what Jesus says. I'm looking, I'm calling, I'm choosing, so that you can be with me. Guys, this is so bedrock to who we are. This is something that we cannot mix up. You know, I think 
I think generally speaking, now these are generalities to be sure, but I think generally speaking, women understand relationships much better than guys. At least in my family, or at least Sandy tells me that. <laughs> Guys, we just want to know what the end story is. You know, give me, the, give me the bottom line. You know, just tell me what the end is and let me do that. You know? you know, I don't need to know all the things leading up to that. Just tell me the bottom line and I can do that. You know, I wonder how many of us short circuit the plan of God in our lives because we're just looking at the bottom line. We're just looking at, okay, what's the end game here? Okay, you want me in church? You want me to read my Bible? You want me to tithe? Uh, you want me to pray? You want me to do this? Okay, I can do that. I can do that. It's good. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. That's not what he wanted. He called us to be with him. That is his desire for us. That is the number one thing, is that he wants us near him and close to him. You know, the Bible is living, is living proof of this. We see it again and again. Of course, the classic example is Mary and Martha, you know. We use that one quite a bit about, you know, Martha being busy with things and Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's a good example. Jesus says there are only a few things necessary, really only one. And Mary has chosen the better part. Mary has chosen the part to remain at my feet while Martha is off you know, being distracted by all of her preparations. Now, every time I reference this verse, there's always someone who comes up to me and says, well, somebody has to do the work. Somebody has to do it. I mean, some, I mean we just all can't sit at Jesus' feet all the time. Someone has to do the work. And in that moment, I'll concede and say, yes, you know, someone has to do the work. But here's the catch. In that particular account of Mary and Martha, the point that Jesus is making is this, is that Martha was distracted with all her preparations. You see, it's okay to be preparing. It's okay to have a busy life. Many of us have busy lives. That is not evil in itself. What turns out to be evil is when we push God to the margins because our life is so busy it becomes a distraction to us and God gets pushed to the margin. That is what's evil. In fact, I would say blasphemous that we push the God of the universe, the creator of the universe that breathed the whole universe into being, just a thought in his mind, breathed the whole universe into being that we just push him to the side. Oh, sorry, no time today, busy blasphemous at the least. God has called us to not be distracted, but to have him at the center of our lives. Is it possible to have a busy life and still have Jesus at the center? Absolutely. Absolutely. I could recount the, I could recount the people to you, a least of which is, is uh, not least of which, is Brother Lawrence in his little book, Practicing the Presence of God. That although a monk in a monastery, he would, he would, no matter where he is at, whether he's washing potatoes or out in the garden or whatever he was doing, his lifestyle was practicing the presence of God. Yes, busy in some ways, but yet Jesus was the center of his life. You know, Jesus tells a parable about a man who went out sowing. And it says when he sowed, some fell on the path, which was trodden down and the birds of the air just came by and they just snatched it up and ran away with it. A second group fell among stones and, and, and when uh, it took root, but when that came up, the sun came out and scorched it and it, it withered away. And then there was this third group of seed that was, that was cast among the thorns. And it says that the thorns came up and it choked out the word. The last group was was thrown on fertile soil and it yielded fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. But you know, Jesus defines these thorns coming up and choking out the word. He says they're this. He says, it's the cares and concerns of the world. Those are the things that come in and choke out the word. And I would say much more than the word. Choke out him being the center of our lives that pushes him to the edge. That those things come in and they just choke out any, any bit of life that we have with him. Is it possible to live a busy life with Jesus at the center? Absolutely. In fact, it's necessary. In fact, it's desirable, I would say. 
It's desirable because I think God wants us interacting in this life. I don't think it's God's intention for 99.9 of us to live in a monastery somewhere. I think God's intention for 99.9% of his people are to be active in the world, working in the world. I believe that with all my heart. But if we're marginalizing the king of creation, king of the universe to the edges of our lives, it's wrong. It's just wrong. And so for us, we must first understand that God has called us to be with him, that that's his desire. You know, this verse is often quoted as well. The book of Revelation, Revelation chapter two, this is the church at Ephesus. And again, this is the This is the Lord speaking where he says here in this particular verse, he says about the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. He's saying this to him. Three things mostly and a a fourth I'll add. I know your deeds, the things that you're doing. He's basically saying these are great things. Your deeds, your works that you're doing are awesome. You're doing a great job. And then it goes on to say, and your toil, meaning that as you're working or as you're doing these, de- these deeds, it's not an easy thing. I mean, you're really focused on it. You're really working towards it. You're really moving forward. Despite the opposition that's coming your way, you're still doing it. So he talks about deeds, he talks about toil, and then he talks about perseverance. So you're doing the deeds, you're doing the toil, and in that you're persevering. You're persevering till the, till the end. You're going to be an overcomer in the kingdom, persevering to the end. And so he's, he's, he's praising them for these things. And then he adds, and you cannot tolerate evil men. But jumping down just a little bit farther in verse 4, he says, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. That you've left your first love. That you've gone away from your first love. Boy, this is the deepest rebuke of all. This is just a deep rebuke. I mean, they're doing great things for God. But they've left his presence. They've marginalized him. They've pushed him to the edges. They've stopped seeking him, and they've they've become comfortable with doing the works. It's just simply wrong. It's just wrong. And so here in Mark chapter 3, Jesus summons his disciples to be with him. That is the call. It is not a stepping stone to something else. Okay, you guys come and be with me so that you can be effective in the world. Now that's true. That's true that we have to be with him or we won't be effective in the world. But I don't think it's a stepping stone. I think it's an end in itself. I think God's desire, that's his, I mean, that would be enough if we could just be close to Jesus. That would be enough. I think it would be enough for him, and I think it would be enough for us. If we could just come and be his, he called them to be with him, just to be with him. You know, the early church, we get a snapshot of the early church in the book of Acts, the church at Jerusalem. This church Uh, devoting themselves to prayer and the breaking of bread and to the apostles' teaching and to one other thing, which I forget. And he, and they were, they were devoted to those things. And it says, and the, and people were constantly being added to their number, meaning that, that people were continuing to get saved day by day by day by day. I said in the beginning that at this time, the church was growing exponentially. I mean, people were coming to the Lord uh, through Asia and Macedonia and Achaia and and Syria and and Israel and all, even in, in Northern Africa, people were coming to the Lord. Church was growing exponentially, but this is where it began with people being with the Lord, of being with him, close to him, near to him. That is God's desire for us. He calls us, he's looking, he chooses us, he ordains us to be with him. God wants us to be near him. It says in John chapter 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. You'll remember this account. This is the account of of the vine and the branches. And 
Jesus is given an illustration of how we must remain in him. And he says simply there that, that unless you remain in me, you cannot do anything. Unless you, unless you remain in me, you won't be able to do anything. Without me, you can do nothing, is what he says. Without me, you can do nothing. But with him, we can do all things as we draw near, as we come, as we come close to him. Here's the promises of the Lord. God's desire is for us to be fruitful. There in John chapter 15, you can read the progression. He says his desire, desire is for fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. That is the progression there. The Bible says that we are his workmanship created for good works. That God has destined us to do more than just be with him, but that is the place where he wants us and the other things flow out of that. It's not a stepping stone. It's an end in itself, but there will be things that flow out of it. I want to remind you that these are very much normal people that God chooses, like you and like me. Well, at least like you. They're very normal people. Remember where Paul said to the Corinthians, consider your calling. Not many were mighty and not many were noble and, and not many were, were great, but God has chosen the, the humble things of the world to shame those things which are, are great. You see, God doesn't need anything special. He just needs an open vessel to be used. If we seek intimacy with him, he will supply our needs. A good verse for this is John or Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where it just simply says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. See, here's the promise of the Lord that we often miss. We often want the end game. We often just give me the bottom line. Tell me what I got to do. Give me, the, give me the end thing, you know? But Jesus says, no, it's not that way. He said, first seek me. First be in relationship with me. First fellowship with me. First let's be together. And then all these other things will flow out of that. We must seek intimacy with him. And he'll give us authority to proclaim his word. Now, as we read through the scriptures, we see those preaching in such a way that others were unable to cope with the wisdom and spirit with which they were speaking because God's anointing and authority was upon them. I have a friend who this past week, he, has, he, was, at a, he was at a school function for his children. And he was talking to a guy and their children run around, his children run around his legs and the guy's children was running around his legs. And the guy told him, he said, he said, they started talking, and he found out that this guy made his living uh, with his voice. And he found out that the guy had lost his voice a couple months earlier, and he was spending thousands of dollars to get his, to get his voice back. And as the guy's talking, my friend's thinking, well, I should pray for him, but this is a really odd situation, right? I mean, it's an odd situation. You're at a, you're at a public school thing. The... the him and this other guy, they had just met. They're getting to know each other a little bit. And the guy shares this with them. But the guy, my friend, is a serious believer. I know he would do this if the Lord prompted him to. So he's talking. And all the while he's talking, he's thinking, he's thinking, I need to pray for this guy. But realizing how awkward and what an odd thing it would be just to lay his hand on his shoulder. He turns and he takes one step away. And in taking that step away, his heart is convicted. If you take another step, you will be disobeying me. And without taking another step, he pivots back on the same foot and just says, you know, would you mind if I just said a quick prayer for you? And he laid his hand on the guy's shoulder and he just said something really quick like this. Lord, would you just heal my new friend, friend's uh, sore throat or bad throat or however he said it. And that was it. And he said, said, thank you for letting me pray. And he walked away. A week later, the guy sees him again. And he comes rushing up to him and saying, my throat, it's better. He said, he said, I've spent thousands of dollars trying to, trying to get my throat to work better. And after you prayed for me, it became, it became better right after you prayed for me. He goes, he goes, we need to get together. I need to know how this works. <laughs> the guy said, the guy said, let me take you out for dinner. I don't mind. 
uh, spending, you know, 30 or 40 bucks. I mean, you've saved me 25,000 by doing this. So I'm going to take you out to dinner. So they actually did go out to dinner and, and my friend was able to explain to him how it works. Now, I don't know if the guy became a believer or anything like that, but I thought, you know what? That is the Holy Spirit giving his anointing. That is the Holy Spirit opening up a door just like that. I mean, he knew, I mean, the Lord was putting so much pressure on him that he knew if he took another step, he was going to be walking in disobedience. I mean, he wanted to walk away because it was such an awkward thing. But he turned back and he just laid a hand upon him. I bet it didn't last 10 seconds and walked away. You know, whatever happens with this guy, he will never be the same. He will never be the same because of what happened in that one prayer. If we'll put God first, he'll use us to proclaim his word. Last of all, if we'll put God first, he'll work miracles through us. Now, I know some miracles are extraordinary, as the Bible says, like the, like the handkerchief, Paul's handkerchief being taken to others and then being healed. Extraordinary. But there are miracles that God does all the time right here in our body, and you know that. There are people that are healed right up here at the end of the service. Almost every Sunday, someone will, someone will receive a healing. And not only that, but downstairs in, in a children's church, God is doing, doing the same thing down in, down in children's church. You know, years ago, I was going through kind of a hard time. I just felt like the Lord wasn't answering my prayers and everything that I kind of expected him to do, he wasn't doing. I don't know if any of you have ever had any time like that, but it was just, it was driving me crazy, and I was, I was at church praying. I was on staff in a small church, and, uh, and we, had, we had red carpeting that went across the front of the platform, and the rest of the floor was tile except for one band of red carpeting that went down the middle. And it was just two sections, probably half the size of these two sections, a very small church. And I was walking back and forth in front of the church, and I wouldn't say I was hollering at God, because I don't think we should holler at God, but I was raising my voice. I was raising my voice. And I was just crying out to the Lord, and I had my hands up in the air, and I'm walking back and forth on this red carpet. I can remember as if it was yesterday, and it had to be 25 years ago. And I'm walking back and forth, and I'm just crying out to God, where is the God of Elijah? You know, where is the God that when Elijah called out to him, he responded with fire from heaven and consumed the sacrifice? Where is that God? I mean, can you just imagine God's response to all this? I mean, he's just, he's just shaking his head, you know. I'm throwing dust in the air, you know. And, and where is the God of Isaiah? And where is the God of Moses? That Moses, when he lifted his staff, that called forth water and split the Red Sea. And where is that God? I get down to this end, I turn around the other way. And where's the God of Paul, who worked through Paul, and I don't think I said this, but I'm thinking of it right now, you know, who took hankies and, you know, touched his body and touched other bodies? Where's that God? And where's the God of Peter? Where's the God that when Peter preached 3,000 came to the Lord in a day? Where's that God? And I was going down through all the patriarchs and all the saints, and I probably went down through church history, and I'm just, I'm, I'm almost jumping up and down. I'm saying, where is that God? Now, some have said that when you pray, you should always be quiet for a short time so that God can speak to you. (laughs) Well, I've never found that to be a problem because when God wants to speak, um, he just does it. I mean, he just does it, you know? And yeah, I, I agree with the whole idea that, you know, we sometimes have to be sensitive to the still small voice and that sort of thing. But I tell you what, God shut me up in a second. I mean, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just raising my voice and saying, where's the God of Elijah? And where's the God of Moses? And where's the God of Paul? And where's the God of Peter? And I go back this way and I recall a few more patriarchs going back the other way and God interrupts me in a moment, just silences me. He says, well, where are the Elijahs? Where are the Pauls? Where are the Peters? And in that moment, my heart was convicted and I realized that I wasn't in the spot that God wanted me, that it wasn't his fault. He wasn't holding back. He was waiting for me to get in the spot where he could work in the way that he wanted to work. Let's let's give him praise. Give him praise. But that's the Lord's desire 
for each one of us. God's desire is to get us close to him. That's going to settle a lot of things. It's not a stepping stone, but God will use that to minister to people around us. It really is an end in itself, and we must see it like that, because what often happens is we'll press into God until we get what we want, and then we'll leave God behind and pursue the things we want. That's usually the way it happens. We'll press into God until we get what we want, and then we'll leave God behind and pursue the things that he's given us. God wants our relationship with him to be an end in itself, that this is what I've come to do. I've come to be with you. I, you have called me, you've been looking for me, you have chosen me to be with you, and I have come to be with you. Lord, help me to do that, to not look beyond that and what you might do through me. Help me not to look beyond that. Lord, let it be an end of itself that I can just be with you. Let's stand to our feet this morning. This is how we're going to end today. If you just close your eyes and shut yourself in with the Lord. Pastor Brian's going to lead us in a little worship here near the end. Just invite you just to stay and just let the Holy Spirit confirm these things in your heart. Prayer teams are going to come forward as as Brian begins to play and, and you come forward and you get prayer for anything you need today, whatever it might be, whether it be financial or emotional or physical, we'll pray for anyone and everyone who wants prayer today. We'll pray for you today. But if you're here today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you know about him, you know of him, but you don't know him. And today, he's just pricked your heart. He's just pricked your heart. And and you realize by the Holy Spirit working in your life today, you realize that that's what your heart has been longing for. What your heart has been longing for is not these other things. What your heart has been longing for is that kind of acceptance and that kind of relationship that Jesus brings. And he won't only bring that, but he'll bring forgiveness of sins. He'll forgive your sins dress you metaphorically in robes of righteousness. And he'll welcome you into his presence. He'll rescue you from hell and welcome you into his presence. If that's you today, come and let us pray with you this morning. We're not going to do anything else. We'll just pray for you and, uh, and that'll be it. In your bulletin, there is a connection card there. If you have made a decision like that today. You can just check that off if you put your name on that. We'll send you some materials on your new life in Him that'll help you along the way. We won't, we won't call you or come to your door or anything like that, but we'll just send you some materials. And so if that's you, just write that down. We'll send those things out to you. So Brian's going to lead us in worship in just a moment. We're going to pray. If you're here this morning and you feel like you're you're the person I've been talking about today, that, that you want the Lord to be first, that you want your relationship with him to be first, but it just seems to be so hard that life just keeps coming in and just forcing the Lord to the margins. We want to pray for you today. Listen, the Lord answers our prayer. The Lord answers our prayers. So if that's you today, I'd like you to come with the others that are coming. You come too. We want to pray for you. So let me pray in general. Pastor Brian will lead us in worship. When he does, you come forward. We'll have prayer teams down here and uh, we'll pray for as long as we need to today. Lord Jesus, we just wanna say thank you for the things that you're speaking into our lives today. We wanna say thank you for your word, oh Lord, that, that always comes tenderly and yet always does, always has its intended work. And so we just say Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for challenging us today, Lord. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for prodding us, Lord, to draw close to you. Lord, we're saying thank you for these things. Thank you for redirecting us, Lord. Thank you for standing as the angel of the Lord in our path and saying this far, but no farther. We need that, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, as we worship, as we pray, and as we go this morning, Let us go in your anointing and in your love. And we just ask it all this day in Jesus' name.
Amen.